This is Vern Benham Grimsley. On campus, I think rather than telling man that he's simply a worm of the earth and a child of the devil, that when religion starts affirming that man is a child of God, and I think this is what Jesus was spending a great deal of time talking about. I counted up one time, and just in the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus calls God by the name Father 152 times, which indicates a passionate concern that people think of God not as an omnipotent ogre or as someone who's just waiting to strike them down, but as a God who's friendly and loving and not a guilt-producing God, but a loving God, as in the parable of the prodigal son, who welcomed the son back after he'd gone out and spent all the money and lost the fortune and done all these bad yeah, things. So if you're going to believe in religion, then you have to accept this type of view. Otherwise, you're going to walk around feeling guilty and being a very unhappy person the rest of your life. I mean, you're going back like in the Old Testament, and there's obviously so many inaccuracies and to me, fables, I, I mean, I just can't accept it as a, ra as a rational human being. And the New Testament, I, I can to a, a much greater degree. I think bad religion is one of the worst things that can happen to a person, but I, I say I think bad religion oh. is one of the worst things that can happen to a person, but good religion, as embodied and exemplified in the lives of the really great religionists, who were men who somehow had so much joy about their lives and so much of the creative, positive power that most people are looking for in life anyway, that they were able to draw crowds. I wouldn't walk across the street to hear somebody tell me how wretched I am. But I'd go listen all day on a mountainside, as a lot of people did in Palestine, to hear somebody telling me I was a child of God and a brother to man, and I had tremendous spiritual potentials. Talk in terms of the logistics of it, this is how Jesus got his crowds, I think. He was not telling bad news, he was telling good news. In fact, that's what the word gospel means. Although, strangely enough, the way we have it being presented to us today, so oftentimes it sounds like nothing but bad news. That's a travesty, I think, on the actual teachings of Jesus. There's one thing a physicist said one time, and he was referring to the necessity to send American scientists to other countries in the world to help them with their scientific development. A very quotable line said by this physicist in a speech that the best way to communicate an idea is to wrap it in a person. We can look at the life of Jesus this way, for example, that here was the love, the compassion, the mercy, the forgiveness of God in a person. Uh, the Christians are exploiting religion at the present time, uh, exploiting religion in what sense would you say? Well, their, u their basic idea is right, but the way they're putting it across and the way they're making a... a uh, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're a, a, a damned sinner and you're dead and you're never going to come to life. Well, the idea that Jesus was uh, trying to put across was love. I'm sure if uh, Christ were to come back today, not only would he not recognize anything on the planet as even vaguely uh, resembling his teachings, but he would probably be grabbed, uh, tried for treason, subversion, and revolution, and stuck in the electric chair just as quickly as we could. Several of the most interesting things I can imagine doing would be, number one, taking William Shakespeare to the Shakespeare Festival in England, the annual one, and secondly, what? <laughs> That's an absolute sadism. <laughs> and the second one would be taking Jesus of Nazareth to a series of Christian worship services. Oftentimes what people have heard in the name of Jesus and what's been represented as his teaching is not, and consequently it hasn't... What? I'd like to hear... Well, one more thing after this is... I wanted to finish though. Is I'd like to hear what you have to say about, you know, Jesus did battle an awful lot of the good stuff with the, with the hell idea. And um, so often though, you, or one thing you mentioned earlier was about the idea of fear and how uh, religion alleviates fear. But the, the major... Um, uh, the, the major tactic that, that that used by religion, especially in Middle Ages and even until now, especially Christianity, the, the major tactic that they threw upon people to to um, to keep them in line, to keep them within the church, within religion, was this fear tactic of you're going to go to hell. That, that's the thing that really scared because me. that's always the easiest way. As soon as a religion, a great concept, a great truth becomes perverted it's perverted in the easiest way. As soon as we're trying to get people to be good and we ourselves <laughs> have lost sight of the tremendous spiritual power there is in the proclamation of good news, then the only thing we can think to do is to proclaim bad news. It's the parent who is unable by the love, the winsomeness, the beckoning nature of his own example to teach a child how to love, how to respect other people and so forth. It's finally that parent who has resorted to strong and coercive tactics to bring about this kind of behavior in a child. And I think religion has done the same thing, that when they lost sight really of the power of Jesus teaching that man is a child of God, loved by God, and man is a brotherhood, and as soon as they lost this, they started setting about to draw 
terrible, horrendous pictures of, of of what? He lost it awful early. I mean, you know. Well, I think they did. Right, right. <laughs> she just died. Yeah. The teachings of Jesus were being perverted during his own lifetime, even by some of his own followers then and there. And I think certainly they've been twisted down through the centuries too. But the religion of Jesus is different from the religion about Jesus, which historically we see portrayed. And I think that's an extremely important distinction to make. One more question. I have to go to class. I, re I really like to, you know, talk about this for a long time. It's really interesting. Well, thank you for talking. But uh, <laughs> you're welcome. But uh, one question I, I, uh, I would like to ask is now we mentioned some of the great philosophers. Uh, well, we mentioned Freud, for example, who thought religion was somewhat of a, of a neurosis. Um, Einstein, uh, Schweitzer. Now, these people, according to even the, the Gospels, would be damned to hell at the end of their life. And um, probably almost with, their, with most other people, too. But now, how do you, from a personal view, see this about now, let's say, these men would be damned and so many other people would be damned? Uh, I mean, I'm really going to put you on a spot as far as, you know, the heaven-hell ethic. I, mean, I see. Well, I really, I really would like you to be very. I'll give my answer, and I'll give my answer directly from the teachings of Jesus. I think it's possible to draw a number of conclusions about what Jesus said about the afterlife and how man attains to it. But the most clear and simple one would be on an occasion when he gave his two great commandments, and someone came to him saying, "Master, what must I do to have eternal life?" In other words, how do I get this? The very question you were dealing with. How does a person attain this blissful state beyond the grave? where he's going to be free to grow more, progress more spiritually. And Jesus, in this context, gives his two great commandments, which are, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, and this fellow, who happened to be a lawyer, or a scribe, according to the New Testament, who'd asked Jesus this question, said, well, you have answered very wisely. Jesus said, do this, and you will live. The love of God and man is two great commandments. Now, the question had been, how do I gain eternal life? Jesus gave those two commandments and then said, do this and you will live. So in that context, I think Jesus was saying that this love of God and man, by faith alone, that man is able to have this eternal life, and I do believe in this, and that it's real, it's not just some poetic postulate which he was advancing, and that that's what's required for it. But Jesus also came around uh, many other times and said, if you do not name, if you do not believe in me and believe in me as the Son of God, which these people didn't, these, these uh, great men and other, uh, now these men did not do that so in a sense I guess they love God and man they did in a sense but they really defied the idea of name ha have me be your savior and um, you know lift lift your heart to me so in a sense though then they it brings back the question I still see where they were they're damned according to, to current religious process well I think for one thing Jesus was not so concerned in just going around standing on every rock and mountaintop yelling forth to everybody to believe in me. I think he was not so much saying, just believe in me, but believe with me. Not just in me, but with me. In a God who is the universal father of us all. For example, in the Gospel of John, at one point Jesus says that whoever keeps these words, does my words, will never taste death. I think in the spiritual sense he was referring to it. Now his words, that is to say his commandments, those things he most emphasized were just that, the love of God and man, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Jesus was not going around just trying to save people by formulas. He was not a ritualistically minded person. He didn't say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, ergo, Q, E, D, therefore you're going to get into heaven. But he was a man concerned with the spiritual life. In fact, oftentimes he spoke against this formulization of religion which implied that man had to go through a certain number of rituals, creeds, and so forth until finally he was admitted beyond the pearly gates. Jesus, for example, was more concerned with clean hearts than with clean hands, and on numerous occasions he did not go through all the ritualistic washings that a person was supposed to, even before he sat down and ate a meal and so forth. So he was concerned with the spirit of it. Uh, that's, that's a good point. It sort of answers me uh, to a great deal because, see, I mean, like most people, they fear, they want to know exactly what can I do to get into heaven or something. And they think, well, if I sit down and say 10 Hail Marys, that'll do it. You know, something they can be sure of. It's just like, you know, you know, it's like, you know, you, you don't want to risk. Sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, something you can hold in your hand and say, well, this is it. You know, like, like you know, this, the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I mean, they'd really have that bird in the hand in this case, you know, and be sure. But, I mean, you know, Jesus just wasn't, couldn't be able to get formers like that, you know. And I, okay, that, that sort of answer. Jesus saw this was too simple a thing. Down through the history of religion, that's been the very perversion of it. That people have been all too willing to lose the living, vibrant, vital spirit of a great religious teacher's life by so encrusting it with the barnacles of so many creeds and little offices, duties, etc., surrounding it, that the real impetus, the real strength of it, 
was diffused. So Jesus did not want that to happen, I think, with his teaching. Yeah. Thank you. It's been nice meeting you. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you mentioned a little bit why your, why your discussions, theological discussions, are catching on a little bit to certain people. And it's because of the idea that there is, I think, some communication and, and, and a reasoning process. In other words, that, you know, you're incorporating my words and at least examining them yourself rather than, than just willing to throw out and, 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 and not have any type of uh, exchange. Okay, good to see you. Well, I just wanted to ask you a question. Uh, I think the, it seems to me that the uh, Christianity and the, uh, you know, I mean, it's great to have this spiritual feeling walking down the street, but I mean, you know, you just can't exist on that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this has been one problem. Religion has sometimes been a tacit denial of that which it ought to be affirming. The joyous interrelationships between people, the joyous parts of life, be it the pursuit of truth, beauty, goodness, whatever. And that religion is not just a compartmentalized thing where one has his relationship to God and then it makes no difference in the rest of these realms. I think it totally transforms one's emotions, one's attitudinal structure, and he's able to have a new sense of living as a child of God and a brother to man and by spiritual values, whatever he's doing whatever pursuit he's engaged in, and that religion can elevate and edify every one of these aspects of life. Bye, I agree. Uh... <laughs> You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for the booklet, Questions University Students Ask. This offers simple, understandable answers to some of the most perplexing questions confronting modern humankind, such as who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? The title of this free booklet, containing transcripts of unrehearsed, spontaneous question and answer sessions on campus, is Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and growing spiritually. About the processes of inward discovery and adventure, the new power and purpose, potential for every human life. Another free piece of literature is Freedom from Fear. And for those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again. It's Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701 USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. <laughs> <laughs>